Test. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited today to introduce my colleague, uh, Marshall Ma. He's a, a professor at uh, in computer science at the University of Idaho. And uh, he started out at uh, China University of Geoscience, Wuhan, uh, where he did a bachelor's of engineering in land resource management and a doctorate of engineering in geoinformatics engineering. From there, he went on um, to the University of Twente. Is that the right pronunciation? Twente. Twenter, okay, in the Netherlands, forgive my pronunciation, uh, where he did a degree in a PhD in Earth Systems and uh, GIS, and uh, then he went on to work with Peter Fox at RPI as a, as a postdoc, a DCO Data Science Fellow, and he focuses on uh, data science, semantic web, and cross-disciplinary interactions, and uh, scientific discovery. He's been involved in the Keck uh, Deep Time Data Infrastructure Project for a number of years, and he's, a, he's become a really, really important collaborator for us in, in the 4D initiative, so I'm very excited today uh, to have him come and talk to us about some of his work in deep time knowledge bases. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Sean, and also um, thanks to Bob for inviting me to come here for this seminar. Um, today I'm talking about um, our recent work, actually, is a long-term work since, I think, since when I was a PhD student. But just recently, uh, we received a new NSF uh, funding to do more research in this direction. So I will give you, a, first, a background review and then I will introduce you some challenges we faced in the past, and then some new challenges we face in that new NSF project. And then I will, uh, in the third part, I will show you some uh, previous work, and then some ongoing work, and also a vision for our future work in the next three years. Let me begin my talk with uh, um, two photos. Uh, last December, uh, we took a family trip to Stanford. So here on the left, you can see a photo of my daughter, five-year-old daughter. So she was so happy on Stanford campus. But uh, for me, uh, I have another purpose. I want to go to Stanford to see one of the collections in there. Uh, I think it's the University Museum. I want to see the, the so-called last spike. Why I'm interested in the last spike? Because um, when I was an undergraduate student, I think I read, uh, in that time, I read some either stories in a textbook or just in another book about um, the background of uh, the Golden Spike. So I know it's related to Leland Stanford. He's the founding father of uh, uh, the University of Stanford. But then the last spike was used actually in the ceremony when the first transcontinental railroad in the United States was finished uh, on May the 10th in 1869, uh, someplace in Utah. And then uh, Leland Stanford, he used this uh, last golden spike as a kind of mark to show the railroad was complete. And then even now, I think that place is still there. It's, uh, now it's, uh, I think, a national historical site I have not been there before, but it's on my, it's on my list. So late, I think in the future, I, I may travel there to, to see this place. But, um, so I think this means a lot for uh, the Utah State and also the United States. But then you can see the golden spike has a kind of meaning, a meaning for the joint point or the meaning for the boundary. So, I, th I think that's why in this uh, international coronal stratigraphic chart, or in other words, the geological time chart, people use the golden spike as an icon or a mark to show the boundaries 
between um, the, coronal strat the coronal stratigraphic units, like uh, uh, the stage, the series, the system, sometimes even the even the era system, uh, the era theme or the enotherm. So golden spike has a meaning of boundary or joint point. But that's just the nickname. So geologists, they have a very formal name for golden spike. It's, uh, the short name is GSSP. The full name is Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point. And on this slide, you can see the golden spike for uh, Adikara. I think it's located in the south part of Australia, close to Adelaide, I think. So, so here, uh, you can see this uh, bronze plate. Actually, geologists, they just use this as an icon to show the location of the boundary. And then they call it a golden spike. So here I want to show you um, the definition of uh, geological time and uh, geological time scale since we come from golden spike to the geological time scale. So I'm not a pure geologist. My background is um, geoinformatics. So in my uh, simple understanding, geological time means the history of the Earth. But then geological time scale is a framework, a framework we used for the representation of geological time. So since it's a framework, so we have a way to represent it in a computer model. So when geologists see strata and fossils in geological time scale, computer scientists see concepts and relationships in the geological time scale. And then I have knowledge base in the title of my presentation. So here I want to first give you a definition of knowledge graphs. Uh, I just heard about this uh, definition uh, last week in a, in a computer science workshop. So I, I will just read it. Knowledge graphs are large networks of entities, their semantic types, properties, and also the relationships between entities. So in simple words, we can think a knowledge graph as a, as a number of concepts, and then the interrelationships between those concepts. And in a knowledge base, we can think of it as a computer system for the storage and the usage of one or a few knowledge graphs. Okay. Since I'm talking about uh, how computer scientists see the geological time scale, so let's see more details, the computer understanding of uh, geological time scale. Uh, people have already done some research in that part, and we can see there are two key concepts in geological time and also the geological time scale. Very simple, interval and uh, instant. Or in the geological terminology, is the unit and the boundary. So when we talk about interval, we mean a period of time. And then when we talk about instant, we mean a particular point in the time. If we take Jurassic as an example, we can say, okay, Jurassic means if you use it as a, as, a time, as a time concept, Jurassic means a period of time in the history of the Earth. But Jurassic has a starting boundary or starting point. Jurassic has an end point. So you can see how those two key concepts are represented in Jurassic, right? But that's not the end of the story. We can see a little bit more. I mean, from computer science, we can see a little bit more on geological time scale. So we can see it, we call it an ordinal hierarchical structure. So why is the ordinal structure? Mm. If you think it as a one direction process, I mean the geological time, so starting from 4.6 billion years ago, and then to present, that's a one direction process, we call it an ordinal structure. But then if you think about these different units, the era, era period, epoch, age, that's a hierarchical structure from high level units to no, to no level units. So in computer scientists' eyes, people see this as an ordinal hierarchical structure. 
So that's why uh, in my uh, PhD research period and also uh, in the beginning stage of my postdoc uh, period, I spent some time to develop this uh, portal. I call it um, a, the so-called golden spike information portal. Here the focus is, o is only the golden spike. So I first develop a vocabulary for the geological time scale and then I visualize it with, and I also develop some interactive functions inside the visualization. And then the interaction is with a, a map window. And then when you click a geological time concept in this visualization, you can see some uh, interactions in the map window. Like here, if I click uh, Mesozoic, this will show me uh, the golden spike corresponding to the base of Mesozoic. I think that golden spike is located in some place in Zhejiang province in China. And I also collected some other information. Like here, I can, I can even show an image to show the geological background information of that golden spike. And I can also load geological map surveys from geological surveys across the world. Like here, because this golden spike is in China, so I can load a geological map from China geological survey. So as an end user, you can just click the map layer, you can see more. Uh, geological information, background geological information of this golden spike. The demo system is here. I just tested this this morning. It's still, it's still working. So if you're interested, you can go there and take a look. So I hope everything can be as simple as the golden spike information portal, but uh, the actual world is with more challenges. So I will use this uh, cartoon image to show the challenge of uh, heterogeneity. So people use different language, people use different conceptual models, people, use, people have their own understanding, even for the same geological phenomena. So this causes a lot of challenges, heterogeneities in data sets. This, so how to understand heterogeneity? Let me show you a very simple example. So you may take a quick read of this piece of text right here. Can you see anything that makes you feel a little bit? I know you are all geologists. So when you read this piece of text, are there anything you feel not so OK? So I just copied this uh, example from a paper published by Professor Haley back to the 80s. So here is a simple example. It's just about the terminology. He said, if you really want to use these uh, terms precisely, instead of, so when you mention Corollos geographic units, instead of using late, early, you may better use upper and lower. As you can see on this slide, so for time rock units, for coronal stratigraphic units, you have a base, you have a top, you have a thickness. But for time units, the language is different. The time unit has a beginning, has an end, and uh, has a duration. And then you may use early and late for time units, but for time rock units, you may use lower and upper. And then the objects described are also different. So for time rock units, the focus is uh, the strata. But for time units, the focus is, I think, is time. So that's a part of the heterogeneity. But then in the data world, the heterogeneity can be in much, much more complicated situations. So computer scientists and also people in geoinformatics have already done a long-term research on the so-called data heterogeneity and also the data interoperability. So if you see the two diagrams on the right, uh, here are a few levels people use to describe data heterogeneity and also the data interoperability. 
So from the bottom, you can see system. So basically, it just means if you want to have data, if you want to have your data interoperable, first, you need to have at least some fundamental protocols for the data transfer, just like you have HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol for the World Wide Web. And then the syntax and the schematics means you need to have the data models, the formats. Uh, you need to have them passable or decodable by computer programs. So you have a computer program to open the data set you, you receive. And then semantics means the terminology, the vocabulary, the language, or the meaning of the data set is readable by the machine. So in that way, it's also understandable by the human users. And on the very top, the pragmatics means the data can make contribution to a research purpose. So if you understand the data set at a semantic level, but if the data set makes no contribution, makes no value to your research, you still have some issue with the pragmatics. And then the other levels in the, in the green box, they just explain those technical levels in some easy, in easy language. But they also include uh, two other uh, social issues, the legal, so all the data sharing, all the, uh, and the data reusage should be legal and ethical in the open data world. I will introduce um, the semantic web architecture later. I have another slide for that part. Okay. So let's see um, an example in Europe, how people address uh, data heterogeneity and then to try to promote interoperability for geoscience data set, especially here the example is about the geological maps. It's from a research project called One Geology Europe. But before One Geology Europe, um, there was already a research project called One Geology. So the purpose of One Geology is to uh, promote the sharing of geological maps uh, in the best way at a scale of one to one million. So normally the map service is provided by geological surveys from different countries. But One Geology Europe, um, did something new. So besides the sharing of geological map as a service from the National Geological Service, they also built the so-called multilingual vocabularies. Because you can think about the situation in Europe. Uh, in that project, they have about uh, 20 participating countries. And then they see there are 18 languages used in the maps. So they build a centralized map browser, like, like what you can see in this map window. It's like a European map. It's like a map for the whole Europe. But then the map layer of each country actually is from the National Geological Survey in that country. So actually, there are about 20 distributed servers, uh, servers in Europe to support this map window. It's like a distributed structure. But then on the data heterogeneity side is that most of the maps, they are published in the original national first language. Like in France, it's in French. In Germany, it's in German. In Netherlands, it's in Dutch. So you can see for end user, if you don't read the certain language of that map layer, it's very hard to, for you to understand the meaning of the map, right? So that's why they did this job to develop multilingual vocabularies, but it's a hard job. So they only focus on two topics in one geology Europe. One uh, topic is uh, the geological time or the rock age, and another is uh, the rock type. So what they did first is the conceptual modeling. But in the conceptual modeling, they use English as a modeling language to set up a framework as I said, first for the 2K concepts, interval and instance, and the second, they also set up a model for the ordinal hierarchical structure of geological time scale. And then in the encoding, they attach, so here, 
You don't need to read this code. But you just need to know uh, from this code, from this code on the top, uh, computer scientists establish the ordinal hierarchical structure. And then they also attach these multilingual labels for the same concept. So they, they first they use English as a modeling language to set up the main framework, and then they just attach those multilingual labels. So actually here it's beyond the European uh, country languages. You can even see Chinese and, uh, and the Japanese. Okay. And then using this multilingual vocabulary uh, on, one, on, on the data portal of One Geology Europe, they established some really interesting functions. And one is the so-called federated query. So what does it mean? So on the end portal, you can select, for example, here is uh, Cenozoic. But we know Cenozoic is a really high level unit in the geological time scale. Cenozoic has a lot of sub units. And even the so-called grid, we call it a grid subunits, if I'm correct. So there are several levels. But here, you can select Cenozoic, and then you can also select all the sub concepts of Cenozoic. You can even select the color to rent all the returning uh, polygons from the maps. But then here is a challenge, and also the improvement from the multilingual vocabulary. You can imagine the original map surface, they are in 18 different languages, right? So when you set up the search criteria on the end portal, and you click search, and then from the portal, using that multilingual vocabulary, the query will be translated into 18 different languages to those corresponding servers because we have the multilingual labels. And then the query will be sent to each server, and then they will get the result and they return back to the map window. And then follow the criteria you set up here. You have a color for the result, and then you will see here, like you will only see the, the yellow color for all the units within the time coverage of Cenozoic. So this was what we call the federated query. And it's established by using the multilingual vocabulary. And then in my small research, I also developed some visualization for the multilingual vocabulary. I only uh, choose seven languages, uh, English, Spanish, German, French, Dutch, Japanese, and Chinese. I even set up a demo system. Let me see if I can show you. So I just used um, uh, the United Kingdom geological map as an example in my demo system. So for example here. So for sure, uh, for the UK map, is the language is in English, right? But here, you can see I have a visualization for the geological time scale. And then I can also choose, for example, Japanese. I don't read Japanese, but there are some Chinese characters, so I can kind of read it. And then you can see here, if I click this purple area, I know it's traffic. So by using that multilingual vocabulary, I can also develop some functions to translate traffic, to find the traffic in my vocabulary, and then I can find the corresponding Japanese labels for traffic, and then I can show the result in my visualization. And I can even use the Japanese label for traffic to find more information about traffic in Japanese on the internet. And then I, also, I can also establish some hyperlinks to some external resources. So people can go there like for, for Wikipedia and the Geosense ML, you can go there for more information of traffic in Japanese. And everything here is interactive.
And also by using the multilingual vocabulary, I also developed a few other, um, we call it the data exploration. And here is an example. This example, I finished it about, uh, let me see, nine years ago when I was still a PhD student. So how, how did I do that? So on this side, this is, this is not an image. This is a map server. So I can send a computer request to the map server. I can request the server to send me the legend information of this map layer. So for which time concept, what is the corresponding color in this map layer? And then the server will return me a document like this in XML format. We have a special format for it, it's called SLD, but the fundamental format is XML, the extensible markup language. And then I can parse this document. I can get a list of uh, time concepts covered in this map, I, and then I can send a list to my time visualization and then filter it out. The result is like this. Basically, this means in this result, I only show the time concepts in this map layer. So it's a kind of map legend for the UK geological map layer. That's a computer science process. And then I did the same uh, test for a few other uh, map layers in one geology Europe. This work was relatively new. I finished it in 2017. And then after that, I can do something in the reverse way. So from the filtered visualization, I can generate some new compute comments and send it back to the map layer on the surface side. In cartography, we have a um, method called map generalization. And then I borrow that method from cartography and use it in my research. So, but I just use it in a very simple way. Because I have my vocabulary and I have my computer model for, for the geological time scale. So here, what I did for the, uh, for the generalization or the map generalization is very simple. I just used the color of a high level concept to replace the color of the lower level concepts. Like for Phanyozoic, oh, like here, for Mesozoic, because in the geological time scale, in the international geological time scale, Mesozoic has a, has a unique color. But then we see uh, Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic, they are all the sub concepts and the Mesozoic, and each of them has their unique colors. And the same way for other subconcepts and the Cretaceous and the Jurassic and the Triassic, they also have their unique color. But here I can do a generalization. Here the final result is that I just use the color of Mesozoic to replace the color of all the subconcepts. And then I can get the result in this way. So by using this method, I apply it in different ways. Here is a different uh, result. And in this result, I just use um, a gray color spectrum. So as you can see here, uh, for the sh uh, super uh, elosome and the elosome and the erosome system, subsystem, series, and the stage, for those different levels, I use a color spectrum from light to dark. So basically means I don't care about which concept it is. I just care about the level of the concept. Like for uh, Jurassic, Cretaceous, they are in system. So for all of them, for all the concepts in system, I use the color of this gray color. So I apply this spectrum to the map layer. I, I generate a um, SLD document and send it back to the server side. And then the result is like this. So I think we can see some patterns from here. Basically means, I think there are several meanings in, in, in this result. So if you see light color, light dark, uh, or light gray color in, in this result, basically means the time concepts used in that area is at a really, really high level. So 
I think this has maybe has two meanings. One meaning is that in that in that area they do not have very detailed geological investigation yet. This is one reason. And another reason maybe just because it's very, very old. So there's no fossil record discovered in that area. So for example, in the very north part of the United Kingdom, it's just pre-Cambrian. They do not discover fossil records, so that's why they just use pre-Cambrian as the time time for the polygons in that area. So that's why you see the light corner. So use the same technology, I also apply it at several levels. I can do generalization at a system level. The result you can see here, and you can see some polygons missing. Basically means the concepts in those regions, when you say it's missing, because the concepts in those regions, they are higher than the system level. But if I go a little bit higher level, if I go to Elatham, you can see the result like this. I can even go higher, I can go, I can go to Elatham. And finally, I can just have two super concepts. One is uh, the Precambrian, and then another is uh, the Phenozoic. So the whole map, the whole map, the whole geological map of the United Kingdom will be generalized into only two colors. So here the pink red is for Precambrian, and then the blue is for Phenozoic. And all this work is done by using the vocabulary we developed. So one geology finished in, I think one geology finished in 2010, but that's not the end of the story. They do have some legacies, and then they transfer some of those legacies to an organization called the IOGS, International Union of Geological Science, and it, there's a commission for uh, geoscience information. So people there, they took up the work to develop vocabularies for, for many other topics in geoscience. And also when one geology ended in 2018, people organized a workshop in Berlin. I was there, you can see me here. And then if you look carefully, you can also see Peter, Peter Fox on the left. So this is the first time I, oh, that's the second time I saw Peter and also Let's set up a collection between me, and then finally I became his postdoc. So after, after one year, I graduated from, from Europe, and then I moved to the United States. Okay. So that's some heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneities in the geological time terminology. And I showed you a few examples, and then how people are working on, or have been working on to address that challenge. And then, in nowadays, we have a new environment called open data. As you can see in this cartoon, we have a slogan for open data, as close as necessary, as open as possible. So if, if you are still in your very early stage doing your research, you can keep your data close. You don't need to share it with others. But at a later stage of your research, if you have already published a lot of outputs, maybe it's good to share your data set. And then in the 4D program, originally called the DTDI, we have already investigated a, a number of data resources in different disciplines. And we are considering, we have been considering to use these data sources for the deep time research. And many of them actually, they have geological time as an attribute in their record. But when I look into details of the time or the age attribute in this database, I saw a few or several other challenges. So if you look at uh, nissel stratigraphy, if you look at uh, paleoclimate, you can see many different classifications of the units and even the terminology people used in, in those disciplines. And those heterogeneous just new heterogeneities, they are also reflected in the databases. So this causes more challenges. If we think about using those data resources in the open data world, there will be more challenges. And here is another uh, simple challenge. 
even the color or the color spectrum, they are heterogeneous. Uh, I think it's about five or six years ago, after I first came to the United States, I saw this um, uh, geological time scale on the USGS website, and then I saw, oh, this is a different color spectrum. So I tried to send an email to the contact person on, on this. I think this is a USGS report. And then they send me the color code, the RGB code they are using. But I don't know how popular this color spectrum is used across the United States on the geological maps. But anyway, I digitized the color spectrum. And then I also have a plan to include the color code in my vocabulary. And then the diagram on the right actually is a visualization I recently developed, so I already digitized it, and then later I will also match this into my vocabulary, trying to improve the interoperability between the USGS color spectrum and also the international color spectrum, the CGMW color code. CGMW is a commission for the geological map of the world. Okay. So I show you some challenges from both the terminology and the uh, the open data world. So let me show you our approach, how to address that challenge, and then some ongoing work, and also our future work. So here we see this diagram again, but now let's focus on just the diagram on the left. So we see those levels of data interoperability. So semantic web, the web environment, especially the semantic web environment, can provide support to almost all the levels in the data heterogeneity or the data interoperability, especially the ontology. This can provide a lot of support to the semantic level. So each ontology is called, let me recall my memory. I think I repeated this at least 1,000 times in my, in, in my class. So each ontology is the formal specification of a shared conceptualization of a domain. So first you have a subject or a domain, and then you have a conceptualization of it. You have a computer, you have a computer model of it. And then you need to come to a consensus or agreement in a community. So it's a common conceptualization. And then after that, you have a formal specification of your conceptualization. You have a formal computer encoding of your model or of your conceptual representation of that topic or that domain. That is ontology. So, and then semantic web can provide a lot of support for you to build ontologies and build vocabularies and then to add machine readable structures and the meanings to the content on the web. Semantic Web was initiated by uh, Sir Tim Blasny. You can see a photo of him on the right. He is also the creator of uh, the World Wide Web, not the Internet. Internet is different. <laughs> internet is different from the web. Internet is like the physical infrastructure we see, and the World Wide Web is just one of the many applications established on the Internet. There are also many other applications on the internet. And then semantic web is just an extension to the conventional web. And then by adding those uh, machine readable structures and the meanings, the aim is to change the web from a web of documents to a web of data. And uh, you, may have a you may have heard about um, um, a new search engine released by Google. It's called uh, the Dataset Search Engine. It, I think it's just released uh, in September or October last year. So in this new search engine for dataset, the technical approach uh, Google applied also reflect something similar to the idea of semantic web, machine-readable structures and machine-readable meanings. And actually, this year, 2019, is uh, the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Just uh, a few weeks ago, on March the 12th, P. 
people celebrate the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. So if you are a fan of uh, Google Doodle, you may just go back to check the Doodle. Google released on the day, March uh, the 12th. And then the computer you see here actually was the one uh, certain Blasny used to build the first website on the World Wide Web. That's something fun. Okay. But now let me show you how can we use semantic technologies from the semantic web to increase machine readability, to increase the quality of my knowledge graph or my ontology or my vocabulary for geological time. Here I want to show you a very, very recent work, actually it's still ongoing. It's for the concept and uh, attribute versioning in the geological time scale. On this slide, I collected, so as old as I can, all the international chronostratigraphic chart or the international stratigraphic chart. That's the older name, it's called the international stratigraphic chart. And in recent years, they changed the name to international stratigraphic chart. So I click all the versions released by the International Commission on Stratigraphy back to 2004. And then to the most recent one is released in August 2018. And also it's very interesting. Let me show you something. Uh, that's what I have. Shana, maybe you can help move this on. So, I, I, I just received this chart from uh, Professor Junxuan Fan. He is a he's an informatics unit chair for the International Commission on Stratigraphy. So you can see conventionally people just use, for the chart, people use the layout like a spreadsheet. But it's very interesting. Recently they also begin to try this uh, cycle, the layout like a cycle. So I don't know what will happen, but this shows something that I am also interested in. So let me create some new collaboration co uh, opportunities between me and the International Commission on Stratigraphy. But here, okay, let's come back. Let me show you how we use semantic web technologies to do the concept and the attribute version. So what is this concept and attribute version? What do I mean? So for example, if you compare, uh, you can see I just take a screenshot of just a tiny part of the chart. On the right, you can see the version uh, released in February 2017. And then on the left, you can see a version released in July of 2018. And then a big change for the 2018 July session is you can see three new ages, actually three new golden spikes were added in Holocene. I think there's even a report on nature, and there are even some arguments about why they added this so easily. But here, let me just focus on this as a new concept. So you can see for those three ages or stages, they do not exist in this 2017 version, right? And also, the two golden spikes on top, okay. The one at the bottom for the base of Holocene is already exist. So for those two golden spikes and those three new stages, they do not exist in this 2017 version. So we call it new concept or concept versioning. And then what is attribute versioning? So if you look at here for Sakmari, this is a unit at the stage or the age level. So you can see for the number of it, it changes a little bit. And even the uncertainty also changes a little bit. So that's the attribute change. And then we have a way to record those changes. We just recently did some work to record those changes. I reused some ontologies and vocabularies from the IOGS CGI. And then here I want to show you how we did that. Because originally for the IOGS CGF vocabulary, their focus is uh, 
chart by chart. So they use the chart as a central object and the work. But in my recent work, I made some updates. I take each unit, oh, not unit, I take each concept as a central object and work. And then I can see this concept exists in which chart. So it's like a reverse way. So in this way, I can show the concept reversion. For example, uh, this, uh, if I pronounce it correctly, the Makhalayan, uh, the first appearance of it is in 2018 July. And later it also applied, uh, appeared in 2018, the August version. So I just used those code to show it. It showed up in two versions. And then that's it. But for some other concepts, they may have already showed up a lot of times since 2004. Okay. And here is the code I used to show the attribute version. So if you have an attribute change, I can also use uh, this in scheme to show for which number of the boundary it show up in which chart. So for this one, for example, for two, uh, 295, it showed up actually in a number of charts. But here I just show you the change from 2018 uh, July to 2018 August. And I just show them in the blue color. Mm -hmm. I can do the same thing to show the uh, change for the uncertainty. So even for the uncertainty, I have a way to show the change. Okay. But that's not the end of the story. So just very recently, I, we got this uh, NSF project funded. The topic actually is called a large space of deep time to facilitate data harmonization or data interoperability in the geosphere and the biosphere core evolution research. And uh, the aim of this research is exactly what I just presented in, in the past hour. But we also have the aim first to build this uh, uh, knowledge base, and then second, we want to do some data integration and the data harmonization work. And here you can see a list of those uh, databases and the consideration. And very recently, uh, some of you may know this uh, time scale creator. So uh, just about one month ago, when I attend um, a workshop in China. Later, later I will show you, in, I think in the next night, I will show you more details about that workshop. I meet uh, Professor uh, James Ock, and he showed me he can share a lot of uh, those uh, lethal stratigraphic and also paleoclimate units, time units, to me. And last week, he just sent me a, a data set, and then actually I was, now I was analyzing that data set, and that, that helped me a lot in building my um, knowledge base for the deep time. And uh, one of our final aims is a fair data, the so-called findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data set. And actually in the United States, the earth science community takes some needs to push the fair data. And you can see here an article in US published very recently, just in November last year. Okay, before the end of my presentation, I want to show you um, deep time. So deep time research is not only in the United States. Um, there, are, there are also a very new effort happened uh, last month in China. It's called uh, the so-called the DDE, Deep Time Digital Earth. And when the forum was taking place, there was also a short report on science. And uh, Shauna actually attended the workshop and gave me a very wonderful and impressive presentation about her work in the, in the 4D program. So I think China is going to uh, establish a deep time, the so-called deep time digital earth research center at uh, Quinshan. Is a, is a city close to Shanghai. And uh, Professor Chen Chan Wang, some of you may know him, he, he is the leader for this effort, this DDE effort. 
And we think this is a community of practice, and we see a lot of um, opportunities for the application of my work, my work on the knowledge base of deep time. Okay. So to conclude my presentation, why we need a knowledge base of deep time? We can make a wider data collections across different disciplines in geoscience. And then by using the structures, the machine-readable structures in the vocabulary, we can do faster relationship analysis and inference. So in this way, this may help generate more interesting and insightful hypotheses in geoscience research. And how are we going to build it? We're going to use semantic web technology for sure. And then because this can increase the machine readability of the knowledge base, and also, we're going to build a service based on the knowledge base to support, to establish like an interface between the workflow platform like Jupyter Notebook or R Markdown, an interface to a lot of data resources by using our uh, knowledge base of the deep time. Okay, so in that, that's all my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. have time for a few questions. Does anyone have a question? I wondered if you uh, were going to consider putting in gradient information. Mm -hmm. You've got, you've got uh, changes which happen according to your chart yeah. instantaneously. Yeah. But some of the changes, the gradient is very interesting and yeah. so for instance, uh, polar reversals, yeah. how quick are they? Yeah. I don't know. And most recently, now we talk about uh, <coughs> climate change. Well, when did it start? Was it 1800? But it, there's more information than just the start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can I answer that now? Yeah. So that's a really great comment. Thank you so much. Actually. When I meet with uh, uh, Professor Aug uh, one month ago in China, he gave me the same suggestion. He told me, for your vocabulary, for your knowledge base, don't focus only on the terminology and uh, the numbers. In the best way, you can also include some geological background knowledge into it, because that part will be of more interest to the geoscience community. For the computer science community, they may be more interested in the terminology and the numbers because they can use it. But for the geoscience community, they may have a different focus. I think we're going to yeah, take some efforts on that. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate your talk. And following up a little bit on what Selwyn said, most of what you've described so far, the, the data science and the visualizations you're doing yeah. are being reactive to the community of scholars that define chronological units and, and times and so forth. Um, do you foresee a time in the future when indeed these will be done more automatically through the data science itself? Um, for example, with PaleoBioDB, yeah. um, you know, we know that some of the mass extinctions which define these boundaries are more gradual and they're reflected by changes in and faunal, for example, the foraminifera population or something like that where, where you do have a gradualism. So it's, it's possible to use the data resources rather than a committee sitting around a table. Maybe the data resources themselves can be the drivers of these changes. Any thoughts about that? Yes. Um, so if I only focus on the knowledge space and also after some extension, after the coverage of uh, those heterogeneous terminologies in different disciplines, as soon as I can see the usage, we can use it to do data integration from different resources. Because, for example, if I just select a certain concept, it can be a very unique, very rare concept, maybe only used like in <coughs> lithostratigraphy stratigraphy or just in the paleoclimate. You can know the period of time, you can, you can know the start, you can know the end, and you can use the attribute as uh, the criteria for some data search. So that's from the end user side. But then from the database side, they can also include this as a part of their service. 
So actually, for example, I even did some uh, uh, interactions with uh, PBDB. So uh, from what I found is that um, they, they already included all the international, um, I mean, the concepts in the, in the international geological time scale. But for some local lethal stratigraphic units, they do not have a complete list. So if I search just with a human readable label, I may not be able to find the fossil observation records in PBDB. But I, if I use the period of time, if I use the start and the end, I can find records. So I think the second usage of the knowledge base, yeah, I can also see some potential from the database side. Uh, this is a, a really interesting, make me appreciate, you know, when I collect the miles and how much work is the, into uh, those uh, data collections. So, so my, my question is really general, like in your field, uh, and uh, uh, once you pick a project, you, it's, you need to invest lots of time to develop the concept, to input the data. How, how, how are you competing each, uh, each other? So like, is there other group that's interested to uh, to work on the similar areas and how you communicate and to find out uh, who has, uh, uh, you know, how, in terms of like collaboration and the compute, co compute, uh, uh, competing. So this is how you deal with that. Yeah. Um, so this work is very unique. It's not a computer science. It's not a geoscience. Uh, it's not a pure computer science. It's not a pure. Um, Geoscience, I call it geoinformatics. So actually, I think we have a really good culture in collaborating and sharing the resource with each other. So actually, the Fakabinar work, the very, very initial work was not uh, done by me. It's done by Dr. Sam Cox. He's a researcher in CISRO in Australia. And also uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Richard. He also contributed a lot. He's from Arizona. Uh, state Geological Survey. Um, but I was just follow their work, and then I made some extension, and I also made some applications in my PhD work. When I, whenever I send emails to them, they are always willing to share their work with me. So, and then for me, you can see even my launch space is still ongoing. I already shared it on GitHub. So. I don't know, maybe it's just the cultural difference. So in geoinformatics, we are always willing to, to share our work with each other and discuss the progress with other people and then hear comments and, uh, and, uh, and questions from, from them. Great. Yeah. Oh, okay, we've got a lot of questions. I guess we'll keep going. So Marshall, I really appreciated the talk. And I just want to follow up from the very first question about uh, gradients. And I think in temporal gradients and in spatial gradients, if you look at a geologic map, there's a line drawn in many cases. But if you go into that area where the line is drawn, you won't find an outcrop. There'll be a forest or a meadow. Yeah. And I think that one of the contributions that you might be able to make is a greater understanding of uncertainty. And therefore, the yeah. whole golden spike metaphor might be flawed in that you really can contribute a lot to the concept of fuzzy boundaries. Yeah. You know, what's the last occurrence in time, spatial resolution of a particular fossil in a particular point in space? we might get high precision radiometric data, but then we find out that that same fossil, because of different environmental conditions, existed much longer somewhere else. Yeah. So that boundary is actually quite fuzzy, and I'm wondering if you can introduce sort of concepts of fuzzy boundaries rather than golden spikes, or an instantaneous point. So actually, when you see our encoding of uh, giant certainty, so for the numerical value, of a number, we already have a way to represent uh, some uncertainties or some fuzzy boundaries. That's really okay. But um, for the geoscience background, we still need to think about, especially for some geospatial representations in the in the geoscience background knowledge. We still need to think about a good way to represent that in the in the knowledge base. A really wonderful platform. Uh, my question is kind of also a follow-up uh, after face question. It's a general question. Um, I just wonder, when you're design, uh, designing this platform, uh, who, are, uh, who are the major users of the platform right now? And, and who are the uh, potential users you're 
are trying to attract and uh, how you're uh, designing uh, the platform depending on the users they're trying to attract. Like, are they general public or are they more scientific? And in which directions of scientists you're trying to attract uh, to use the platform? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think a knowledge base of geological time or a knowledge base of deep time uh, is a very fundamental topic. But then, based on it, we can build a lot of applications to address the needs of uh, different people. For example, the, the Golden Spike Information Portal, I built it how, how long time ago? Almost five or six years ago. When, when I shared it with uh, the geoscience community in the United States, I got really good feedbacks from different people, from museums, from universities. People use it for some, um, they even use it for some outreach and also university education. That's good. But then you can see, we can also use it to address research needs, like uh, in my NSF program, I have the, the final purpose is to address the needs in the data-driven deep time research. Thank you, everyone. That was a lot of really good questions. And let's thank Marshall one more time. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to have lunch, so please